room. Um, you know, tonight what we're going to be talking about is migration madness, those Michigan spring migration, a bird migration. Um, and I uh, let, uh, like we heard earlier, if you have questions at any time, I do want you to know, put them in the chat. That's totally awesome. Or if there's something you're really, really excited about, you want to unmute yourself and interrupt me, that's fine. I get on a roll sometimes, but I love uh, to hear from you too. So let's make this as interactive as possible. If you've got any questions or comments, feel free to throw those in the chat at any time. Um, and there'll be a few different times where I ask you to share some questions. But anyway, bird migration is absolutely incredible. So I'm so happy to get to talk to you about it because to me, it is just one of the world's most amazing phenomena. It blows my mind every spring and every fall when it starts back up again, as I start to realize the kind of massive um, amount of things that are happening and just the incredible feat that these birds do. So this here is a black pole warbler. And as you can see from the image there, the black pole warbler winters in Venezuela or in um, some of the southern parts of the United States, but mostly down in South America. And that bird every year flies about 20,000 kilometers all the way up into the high boreal forest, almost up into the Arctic to have their nests and to make lay their young. Now, what's so incredible about this bird is that this bird is five inches long and weighs 0.4 ounces. So just to give you an idea, 0.4 ounces is the size, weight of two quarters. So put two quarters in your hand, imagine that as a living thing, and then imagine that living thing flying from South America all the way up into Alaska, and then back every single year. And when it gets there, it's not like it's taking a vacation, it's uh, fighting its hardest to lay eggs and raise those young. So absolutely just incredible that two quarters can fly on its own power all the way across the Gulf up into Alaska. Uh, just that, that alone, right? We could be done right here. That's just that's crazy, right? Um, but it, it gets crazier. Um, there are amazing migration spectacles. Yes, distance is cool and the small birds flying really far is impressive. Um, but this is a flock of somewhere around probably 20 or 30,000 canvasback ducks. And this is right in Lake St. Clair. It's taken by um, a fellow named Justin and posted the Birding Michigan page. Um, and here he's showing casing the uh, amazing migration of waterfowl and particularly how they congregate in huge numbers where to a point to where almost the majority of some of their populations are all in the same place at once. Could you imagine getting together um, with all of your best uh, 20,000, 30,000 friends every year to go migrate down to a new spot and then back up before you disperse? Uh, again, a, a spectacle to be seen. If you can make it over to Lake St. Clair in the uh, late fall, early winter, you can see this congregation. Just totally incredible. And also to me, what is absolutely amazing about migration uh, is that there's a lot we don't know. So blue jays, probably a bird you might be familiar with, not a, not a huge bird, um, but a, a beautiful bird. They, this is a map that showcases their migration. I'll use these maps a few times throughout today. So just so you know, um, the, the map shows darker purplish areas as to where there's more birds and lighter um, orangish or yellowish colors where there's less birds. I'm going to play this animation. You'll see over the course of a year, the population of blue jays shifts. And you can kind of see a northward shift there in the summer uh, or spring. But then you see also this massive eruption just all over the place in the fall. And that's uh, really hard. If this was just a normal migration, you'd expect to see it all go north in the spring and all go south in the fall. But blue jays aren't normal. They are one of the most common birds in North America and or in the eastern part of North America. And one of the birds that we just don't know what they do in terms of migration. <laughs> we know that they migrate, but we also know that some of them don't. We know that some go north. It, but some also go east or west. Uh, and so again, there's a lot of unknowns about migration, which to me, I think makes it a really amazing topic. Uh, so that was just a quick kind of precursor to get you, you know, hopefully a little bit excited about what we're gonna talk about today. And today uh, I've got three objectives that I hope to accomplish with this talk. I'm, I'm hoping that you all have fun. So if you have questions, again, please get your uh, questions in there. I'll do my best to answer them um, or any comments too. I love hearing um, other people's experience from around the state. Um, down here at the bottom, we've got a flock of migrating red-throated loons um, that come past Whitefish Point in decent numbers. Um, so 
cool bird pictures is another thing that we're going to be seeing throughout today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why and when birds migrate. And also, I'm going to give you some tips on where to see migration for your next birding trip. We're in the heart of um, May madness right now. And so it's a good time to get out there and go birding if it's uh, something you've ever been interested in. Um, so <clears throat> with that, now we're starting. <laughs> now we're starting officially. Um, my name is Elliot Nelson and I work with Michigan Sea Grant. Michigan Sea Grant is an organization to help foster economic growth and protect Great Lakes coastal resources. And we're a confusing program because we have our hands in a lot of different pots, um, but we are a program of Michigan State University Extension. If you're familiar with 4-H or the extension system, we are nested within that. Um, and so there's about 12 of us in the extension system that uh, our educators are around the state, but we also have uh, an office at University of Michigan and half our funding comes through NOAA. We're actually a federal program that's partnered with state universities. We do our work through research. We give out research grants, uh, internships, and we fund other folks' research and students' research. Um, we also do education, like this education program tonight. This is a lot of what I do, going around teaching and doing different classes. Um, and we also do something called outreach, where we work one-on-one -on -one with local businesses or governments to, to help communities and businesses achieve their efforts using the most sustainable means and research-based possible methods. Um, and our focus areas, are the Great Lakes. So we focus on eco ecosystems, fisheries and aquaculture, resilient communities and economies as sort of economic development work, and then environmental literacy and workforce development. So that's Michigan Sea Grant. We're all around the state. We're here to help. If you have any Great Lakes questions, highly recommend you look us up on michiganseagrant.org. And uh, there's probably somebody in your own backyard if you happen to be in one of the coastal areas. Uh, I, in particular, work in Sault Ste. Marie in the Eastern Upper Peninsula, and my focus areas, I do aquaculture, so I work with fish farmers around the state, and I also work with a lot of education programs that are involved, aquaculture and hatcheries. Uh, I do K-12 Great Lakes education programs, uh, and I also do coastal tourism work, mainly in the areas of birding tourism, since it's a passion of mine. Um, I would love to know a little bit more about the uh, 15 or so of you that are on here. So if you could put in the chat really quick, your name, the location, just general, doesn't have, not an address or anything like that. Just, uh, you could say a part of the state you're in or the city. And what's the last bird that you saw or that you were able to identify? So go ahead, if you have that, that chat feature, um, Click on that, it's down at the very bottom. And I'd love to just know a little bit more about who else is on here. Aha, all right, we've got someone from hell <laughs> here today. Uh, been there myself a couple of times, nice little town. Uh, oh yeah, Half Moon Chain of Lakes. So we've got some folks from across the, the different parts of the state here, uh, Hamburg and uh, Debbie, you were able to see a male hairy woodpecker. Those are awesome. Oh, Annie was able to see Dunlin at Ottawa Wildlife Refuge. You must have been down in Ohio then recently, if I recall, that's where that is. Oh, we've got some folks, of course, from uh, South Lyon itself. So awesome, some local representation. Um, so great to see a variety of folks. So I see we got Orioles and Gross Beaks that Priscilla has seen in Southeast Michigan. They are definitely here now. They've really showed up for me in the UP in the last couple of weeks, maybe for a little longer for you downstate. Um, and uh, Tom is also, or Kathleen has also seen Baltimore Orioles. Uh, Lori has got her first pileated woodpecker in her neighborhood. Those are an incredible woodpecker, uh, not necessarily a migratory bird, but a really big woodpecker, the biggest you can see in North America. So that's really exciting. Um, so it, it's great to get to know you all a bit. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, you see Lynn's seen some herons lately. Uh, so all of you are seeing a lot of different birds. Nancy, getting those robins in, the spring robins or maybe the year round robins. We'll talk about that later. Not all robins leave, did you know that? Uh, lots of yellow warblers too, because warblers are really here now. So it's really nice to get to know you all a bit. Thank you so much for sharing that in the chat. Uh, and it'll help me know a bit more about where you all are. And so with that, let's dive in a little bit more to some other things. So uh, one of the reasons that Michigan Sea Grant uh, is involved with birds and birding is because birds are a really important aspect of our Great Lakes ecosystems. And in fact, birds serve as really good health indicators. So a lot of our Great Lakes are under a lot of stress. This is a stress map on the right here. All the red and yellow areas are areas that have more ecosystem stress, like pollution or heavy use. Um, and 
in a lot of ways, it's hard to measure that in a lake, like a big giant great lake. You can't necessarily go in and measure the water quality nonstop or measure all the small fish, but you can get pretty good surveys of bird populations because they're bigger, they're easier to monitor in some ways. And so birds can help us tell us what the rest of the ecosystem is doing in the Great Lakes. So they're really important as health indicators. Um, birds are also an economic driver. In the US in 2012, birders spent an estimated $41 billion on travel and expenses alone. That's not even um, counting bird seed and all those um, backyard things that love, people love to put up. This is just birders going on trips and equipment. So it's a big, big industry, although it is scattered. Um, it is, does have a significant impact. And this was in 2011. We have way more birders now in the U.S. It's been exploding ever since, especially since the pandemic hit. Um, but for a long time, it's been growing. So it's becoming ever more important to local economies. Um, and then there's also a lot of other reasons to help promote birding um, from a Sea Grant perspective. I think personally that birding is, a, there's a lot of reasons why people go birding and why they like to see birds, um, but there's a whole discovery and exploration aspect to it. There's also the photography aspect where you can capture the rare gem like the snowy owl flight flying right at you. There's a fun listing component. It can be competitive at times, believe it or not. You can try to see the biggest uh, amount of species in a single year. If you've never seen the movie, The Big Year is good. Uh, and then uh, there's a peaceful and restorative aspect. It's one of my favorite parts about birding. There's actually really good scientific research that shows that birding and other outdoor activities has mental health benefits and helps restore your attention um, at later times by actually going out into the bird birding world. So and then of course, a lot of people like the social aspect too, another favorite part of mine. So lots of reasons people go birding. You might be a birding or you might not. Um, I'm sorry, you might be a birder or you might not. But if you're not, I encourage you to look at this list and think about maybe it's the thing I would wanna get into. All right, that's just a little precursor, a little bit about Sea Grant, a little about why Sea Grant cares about birds. Um, but now we're gonna dive into a bit more about birds um, migrating and what migrating birds do and why. So in this image here, we've got three different swallow species. Um, these swallows all migrate at different times of the year, but um, they all head down south and all head back up north. The question is why? You know, why would these tiny little birds bother to fly thousands of miles each year? Um, <clears throat> And, and migration really is just that. It, it's movement on a seasonal basis um, from one geographic location to another, in case you didn't know. Um, but why do they do it? Well, this is one of the main reasons. Animals are driven primarily by a lot of different instincts and evolution essentially rewards animals that can survive and reproduce. So birds don't migrate just for the heck of it, right? They migrate because it gives them an advantage in either surviving as an adult or reproducing um, and creating more young so their populations can continue to grow. So that's the ultimate cause, but we'll get into some more of the details. So why do birds migrate um, a little more specifically? And uh, one of the main reasons is this right here down at the bottom. And you might see this, you might go, oh, I don't like that so much. A big cloud of bugs flying in the air. These are midges, a little tiny insect that hatches out of the water around the Great Lakes every year in spring. And, uh, this is essentially food. Uh, food is a huge reason why, why birds migrate. Um, so this is a Wilson's warbler. It comes from down south. And this is their migration map here. And you can see in the winter, they're down in Mexico and a few other places in Central America where they have a lot of food. But in the spring, they shoot back up through the Great Lakes and uh, head right up into the Arctic. Now, what's so incredible about this migration, and it happens very fast here. I'm sorry, I can't slow this animation down or stop it for some reason. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the reality, the amazing part of this migration is that as these birds are heading back north, they are essentially hopping into each state's brand new insect buffet because these birds time their migration so that as they leave that um, warm equatorial area full of nice, good food, they ensure that they have more food to fuel their journey by leaving and timing their migration with the hatches of a variety of insect species. It's really obvious here in the Great Lakes. If you go out in May along the Great Lakes or really any body of water, 
and just shake a branch, you'll see clouds of these midges come off. And these midges live in the Great Lakes their whole life, actually for years. And then right at the start of May, when they're old enough, they hatch out under the out of the water and they crawl up to the nearest branch and they sit there until they reproduce and then die. So they're only around for a couple of weeks where they're all kind of mass reproduction and they're right on the edge of the shoreline. And this lines up just perfectly as the birds are crossing the lakes, flying over hundreds of miles of lakes and landing on the shoreline, right on the edge of the shoreline, right where that buffet is ready for them. In those two or three weeks where that massive buffet of food is all over the place, it's the exact same two or three weeks that our warbler species from the neotropics migrate right through. So this isn't a coincidence, right? This is a well-timed migration to lead to a huge plethora of food that helps fuel their journey till they get up to the Arctic where when they get there, all the mosquitoes are hatching and all the other bugs are hatching, which provides a huge buffet for them as they raise their young. So they time, it's called phenology, the timing of their migration lining up with the timing of bug hatching. And bugs are really um, birds' favorite food for the most part. Um, another reason that birds migrate is to uh, disperse and to get away from each other. So this is a barn swallow migration map. You can see that barn swallows leave uh, North America in the winter and head down to Central and South America, where they are concentrated in quite a few areas that have a lot of food. But then in the summer months, they spread out all across North America, where they like to nest on barns and other human structures, actually. And we have a lot of those for them all spread out. And they can spread out a bit more so that they're not so concentrated and they don't have to deal with so much internal competition. So resource comp or reducing competition is another big reason why birds disperse and migrate. So again, it all ties back to survival and reproduction, but really if you get into the nitty gritties, it's a lot about food and competition um, and reducing that competition. So that's a kind of high level, you know, a bit about why birds migrate. Now I'm going to kind of take you through a little thought process here to try to think about birds from different regions and um, how likely they might be to survive. So thinking about um, these three broad categories of birds, we have birds that are tropical residents. So this would be birds that live in the tropics and never leave. They just live there year round. We have temperate residents. These would be birds that live sort of in North America in some of the colder areas and they live there year round. And then we have migratory birds. We have birds that move from one place to another. Now, for tropical residents, for adult birds, do you think their chances of survival are kind of low, medium, or high? Let's think through a tropical region. It's warm, so that's an advantage. Is there a lot of food? Probably. Warmth, uh, tense temperature really controls productivity in a lot of ecosystems. So the warmer an ecosystem is, the more productivity there is, most likely. So is it a low, medium, or high chance that a bird in a warm place with lots of food is going to survive. Put that in the chat really quick. What do you think? Tropical residents, low, medium, or high chance of survival. This would be for adult birds. What do we think? Do we think that adult birds in, those, in the tropics are, have a low chance of survival, medium, or high based on some of those factors? All right, we got one answer in there. We got Debbie, we got Nancy, we got Penny. Nice, thank you for participating. Really appreciate that. So the first couple of guesses in there are high, and that is correct. Um, adult birds in the tropics are uh, have a pretty high chance of survival. So it's about an 80 to 90 percent uh, survival rate in a given year um, for an adult bird in the tropics. And this is because they can avoid the hazards of winter and also the hazards of migration. That flying involves a lot of risk. All right, how about temperate residents? These are birds that live in areas where there's winters, where there's ice and snow in the winter. Um, do these adult birds have a low, medium, or high chance of survival? You know, what happens in the winter? You could probably figure this out. We might be getting some answers coming in. So we got medium, that's a good guess. Any other guesses out there? These would be temperate resident birds. So these would be things like our chickadees and our cardinals birds that don't leave in the winter, a number of our woodpeckers. Um, 
certainly they can definitely survive. We've got a few medium guesses and that's a good thought, but it's actually a pretty low chance of survival. It's about 20, only about 20 to 50% of the birds in the temperate resident, temperate resident category actually make it through the winter. Winter is really hard on birds. It uses a lot of energy to stay um, warm in the winter. So not all the adult birds that stick it out um, have a high survival rate. Now for migratory birds, these would be birds that spend their summers or winters in the tropics and summers in the temperate regions. These birds do have to migrate, but they have a lot of nice food in the winter and they move, as we said, along with the food, the food explosions as they head farther north. So for this one, I'll just give you the answer here. This is a moderate chance of survival. Um, so birds that migrate, the adults tend to have a moderate chance of survival. So if you're seeing this, you might think, well, why don't all birds just live in the tropics then, right? Um, you know, if the adult birds have an 80, 90% chance of survival, why don't they all live there? Well, surviving is not the only thing that birds need to do, right? What was the other thing we said? Survive and reproduce. Yes, <laughs> reproduce. So how about reproductive success? So for um, tropical residents, what do we think the annual breeding success is? And we measure this by number of young per year um, divided by number of nesting attempts. So how uh, successful might tropical residents be at raising young? Uh, you can give a guess in the chance or a, a guess in the chat at any point here, but is it a low, medium, or high chance? Now, as we think about this, I already said that there's a lot of food and warmth in the tropics. So that might lead you to start to think high, but I also said that birds in the tropics survive, all the adults do. So that means that it's crowded, right? There's a lot of other people there. There are birds there. There is a lot of what we call competition. Um, and so we got a few guesses of medium high, uh, but Penny was the first one to guess it right. It's actually low. So uh, breeding is success is pretty low in the tropics. There's a ton of competition. Um, and during the time where all of the, or when the tropical birds are nesting, it puts a higher demand on those resources. So there's a lot of competition and we don't necessarily have the explosion of resources like we do in the temperate regions, right? So although tropics have more food in the winter months, they don't compare to the explosion of resources we get like in the Great Lakes in the spring. So tropical birds actually have pretty low success when it comes to nesting. Now, temperate birds, um, these would be birds in those regions where resources do explode, they have pretty high success when it comes to nesting. Um, not only do they, um, do, are they already there to take advantage, they don't have to go through that migration process, um, they can also maybe have multiple nesting attempts over the course of the summer uh, because they don't have to fuel back up to fly all the way south. They can just use their resources to try to reproduce throughout the entire summer. So some of our resident birds like chickadees um, will actually lay multiple nests in a year. And so temperate birds have high chance of uh, breeding success. And you probably figured this out, migrant birds about moderate, right? So they will, uh, <clears throat> they will follow those resources and they will be in the temperate re reasons. Um, and so they have that seasonally available food, but you know, they have to migrate and migrate has, migration has a lot of risks for birds. So if you put this together, you see that migratory birds essentially have a moderate chance of, of surviving as an adult and a moderate chance of raising young successfully. Kind of puts them in that sweet spot. Um, tropical residents still do all right in certain ways and so do temperate, but you can see there's different strategies for different types of birds. And that's one thing I want you to remember about migration is there's different types of strategies for different types of birds. Um, challenges though, like we talked about, you know, there are many challenges to migration. Um, it is a pretty high mortality. There's a lot of barriers like inclement weather, having to cross giant oceans is a pretty big barrier, um, having to deal with high uh, airstream currents and things like that. Plus uh, the mere fact that it, it, although birds are really good at sense of direction, some do get lost and get blown off course. Um, and then of course there's predators that know when birds migrate and take advantage of that too. Um, it's also a huge energy demand and uh, it delays their breeding. They can't get started right away because they have to get up there first. So, um, you know, that's a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of migration, the kind of why birds migrate. It's for survival and reproduction. Um, and with that kind of in mind, uh, 
we're going to move on to how they migrate. But before we move on to migrate, how they migrate, are there any questions about the why birds migrate, the why they migrate, or any of the other things we just talked about now? You can put it in the chat, or if you have a question at this point, you want to unmute yourself, feel free. All right. Well, definitely feel free to interrupt me at any time. Like I said, I'm doing all the talking here, but I love hearing from other people too. Um, and so, yeah, feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, so that's a little bit about the why, the survival and reproduction. Now let's get into a bit of the how. How does a bird, and these are all different, what we call warbler species. These are species that live in the tropics. They're um, neotropical migrants. So they live in the tropical regions, Central America, South America, the Caribbean islands, and many of the other islands in the Gulf of Mexico. And they fly each year, even though they only weigh as much as a handful of change or less, um, all the way up into the boreal forest, mostly. Um, but how do they know how to get there? What are some of the methods um, that they learned or that they have innately inside them to get there? Well, if you know, go ahead and put it in the chat. There's a variety of reasons, but I'll start going through these here. So one of the first ways you may have heard this before is that they are visual. Birds have pretty good eyesight when it comes to animals. Their eyesight is pretty um, keen and they actually learn maps at, throughout their life. So birds are born um, not only with an innate ability, but a learned ability that they learn through either uh, with their family groups or through following other migratory birds. They learn how to chart the stars. They also learn um, the sun cycles and also even landscape features. A lot of birds will follow ridges or rivers or shorelines. So they actually see what's out there and follow it. We'll talk a little bit more about how birds follow stars. I think it's totally amazing. Um, but yes, yeah, so they're using visual cues like a map, just like we do. But that's not the only way. Um, the other way is through magnets, like a compass. Birds have built in compasses. They actually have iron in their inner ears that will orient based on magnetic north or south and send a signal to the rest of their brain on which direction to go. So that's really an incredible thing in itself too, that birds have actually built in com uh, magnetic compasses. And the last one, which is probably, I think the least understood, and they're like I said, there's a lot to learn about migration still, but the last one is olfactory. They smell their way home. So some birds literally have the ability to imprint the smell of where they were born and to follow that back all the way. Um, it's it's really incredible. Fish have this ability. It's really common in fish migration. But this was a new piece of information for me about a year ago. I learned that some birds have the ability to smell on their way home. So all three of these, um, you might think, okay, this bird has that, that bird has that, that bird has that. But all three of these tend to interplay in different ways with different species. Each of these kind of compasses come into play and the birds can then use multiple factors to help get them there, multiple compasses. And like I said, um, <clears throat> there are a lot of different um, things still not known about bird migration, but some of the stuff that is known comes from some really incredible cool studies. Um, Dr. Jen Owens at Michigan State University uh, put together some of this information, and uh, she runs the Michigan Bird Observatory uh, and the um, banding station there at Cory Marsh. And if you ever get a chance to go over to the Lansing area and see Cory Marsh, it's a beautiful place, it's open to the public. Uh, say hi to Jen for me. Um, but Jen taught me a lot about some of this stuff, so I'll share with you. Um, one of the first studies to show that birds have a compass inside them um, was actually a study where they would take birds uh, in their migration and for a short period of time, put them in these specialized cages um, that have carbon paper on them. So when the bird bounced up against a side of the cage, it would leave an impression. And you can see that in spring migration, birds left impressions on the north. The birds, as they tried to get out of the cage, were headed north. And in fall, as they were headed the other direction, they headed south. Now, um, these compasses were uh, at times completely blocked off from the sky and the sun. And so indicating that these birds had something not even visual, but rather built in that told them what North and South was. And that was one of the first studies to help kind of get towards that magnetic um, compass that birds have inside. So that one was pretty cool. I thought that was a neat study. Um, 
Another one, another study that was done was right in Flint, Michigan. And so in Flint, Michigan, uh, Robert T. Longway at the Robert T. Longway Planetarium, uh, there was an experiment with indigo buntings. Um, any of you seen indigo buntings lately at your feeders? The brilliant blue birds. Oh, if you haven't, uh, definitely get those feeders out in the springtime because indigo buntings are a fascinating uh, deep blue uh, bird species. But in this study, the um, these birds were hatched in a planetarium. And in that planetarium, uh, the sky was manipulated so that north, uh, the north star was actually in the south and instead of the north. And what they found was that the birds actually followed the north star south, not north, indicating that the birds actually mapped that that star was a central point. And with further studies, they realized that the birds actually know that the North Star is the North Star because it's the only star that doesn't move in the sky. So all the other stars rotated around it throughout the year, but the North Star always stays in the same place. And so the birds actually mapped out the single star that doesn't move. Not that they knew that it was north, but that they knew that it was the star that doesn't move throughout the entire calendar year. And over time, birds actually build star maps in their brains, which is just, again, incredible. So they're mapping the stars, they're using built-in compasses, um, again, and then, and then they're doing things that we probably still don't even know about. <laughs> they're using ridges and smells and all sorts of mechanisms. Um, which is really, again, boggles my mind. <laughs> so I see we've got um, a few comments. Yeah, Penny, they're elusive to your yard. Indigo buntings are a hard one to attract the feeders. It seems just kind of random. I see the most in the spring, um, but make sure you got those black oil sunflower seeds. A lot of birds really like that. And I do see a, a, uh, that some other folks were talking about some of the migrating ducks that headed north, which we'll get to in a second about why why did the ducks migrate earlier than the songbirds? Um, and what is it that causes them to leave and show up? <laughs> All right, so, um, so we covered the why birds migrate. It's for survival and reproduction. We covered the how birds migrate. It's with multiple compasses. And now we'll cover a little bit more about, um, you know, when and where they migrate, how far do they go? Uh, so first off, we'll start with the most incredible bird migration in the entire world, and that is the Arctic Tern. You'll be lucky to see one of these in Michigan. We don't have a lot that come through, but if you're out on the East Coast or the West Coast, they fly along the oceans. And every single year, this bird, which again is very small, it probably weighs a little more than a couple quarters. I think it's probably more like four or five quarters. This bird flies 70,000 kilometers every year. <laughs> it migrates from the high Arctic, the north, all the way up at the north part to the Antarctic every single year. To me, again, this is completely incredible. It's about a 40,000 kilometer derby. I think that's like 28,000 miles or something. But um, that journey not only includes that direct flight, but all these foraging flights. So they used to say it was 40,000 kilometers a year, but now after they put these small geolocators that can track the location of the turns, they tracked one and found that it actually flew 70,000 kilometers in a single year. And these birds can live for more than 25,000 or 25 years. So this means that they're flying essentially the equivalent of um, around the world uh, every single year. It just, Again, mind boggling, but they, some birds, the point here is that some birds go very far. And again, this bird is taking advantage of the summer um, plume of uh, aquatic resources in the Antarctic. And then the other summer <laughs> plume of resources in the North Arctic, uh, the, the Arctic Circle. And so uh, again, it's all about tracking those resources and following them along that food. Other birds like red crossbills, which are a wonky, weird, a wonderful bird that I absolutely love. They migrate variably from year to year. So this is the migration of map again, and you'll see it's kind of a weird movement, right? We would expect to see the yellow and purple move north in the spring and south in the fall, but instead it's just like, oh, there's a little pop-up in the Rocky Mountains, and now there's a little pop-up on the Northeast, and then also kind of in the Great Lakes, and then the East, and essentially this bird is called an eruptive migrant, and as they migrate when there's food to migrate to. If they run out of food, if it's January, they run out of food, which is primarily pine cones, they will move to a new place with pine cones. If they run out of food in May, 
they'll move in May. If they run out of food in November, they'll move in November. So they are called irregular migrants where they essentially move to where the food is. I've, I've been really fortunate to get to see these birds. I've seen young birds in July and I've seen young birds in February. The other thing with these birds is that when they migrate, they also just decide to nest when there's a lot of resources. So that migration is tied to reproduction, but their reproduction is not on an annual cycle. Instead, it's on a resource-based cycle. Um, so again, just a weird wonky bird that migrates completely erratically, well, not completely, based on resources, but not based on annual cycles. And if you know anything about pine cones, you know, or pine trees that um, things like spruce budworm and other factors can really change how many seeds there are in different places in different years. Um, so ultimately birds have a, a variety of migration strategies. Not all birds migrate in the same ways. So some are what we call uh, um, residents. These would be birds that just don't migrate. Uh, I think grouse are a really good example of this. Rough grouse show very, very little migration or spruce grouse. Um, you know, these bigger birds, they don't tend to have massive movements. Turkeys, another one. Um, <clears throat> you know, these birds just kind of have their spot. That's where they are. If there's too many in that area, they might expand the range, but they're not making big jumps. There are then obligate migrants like the swallows or um, hummingbirds. These birds are triggered genetically by the time, the length of the day um, or other cues that tell them exactly what time of year it is. And when that time of year hits, they migrate. Doesn't matter what the weather is, doesn't matter uh, how cold or warm that summer was, it's based on the length of the day. So they migrate and they head off to their non-breeding areas. It's called obligate migration. The whole population moves at a scheduled time of year. It's very orderly, it's very neat. And this is a lot of our songbirds. Our songbirds are primarily those obligate migrants, although there are a variety of other species. Then we have the facultative migrants. So these migrants are primarily things like uh, cranes and waterfowl, and they move when it, when it is time to move. <laughs> so facultative migrants tend to move based on weather, and resources. Primarily waterfall a great example because they move as the ice freezes. So as the Great Lakes start to freeze in Michigan and ponds start to freeze, waterfowl start to head south. Um, Sandhill crane similar. So this means they don't always move at the exact same time of year. If we have a really warm November, December, they may stay into November, December. If we have a really cold December and things are all frozen up, they're going to head south. So it depends on the time of year and the weather. If there's a lot of food, uh, they may stay. And this is where, um, you know, people often say, oh, don't feed birds in the summer or in the winter because they won't migrate or, or don't feed birds because they will mess up their migration. That is true for waterfowl. That's why you shouldn't feed the ducks, <laughs> right, um, necessarily. So, you know, waterfowl, that is true for. Songbirds are obligate migrants, so less true. They're not going to care. They're going to move based on their genetic predispositions. So we've got obligate, we got facultative. Again, this is from Dr. Jen Owens. Big thanks for her for letting me use these slides. Um, and then we have eruptive migrants, like the crossbills. Um, parrots are another type of eruptive migrant that sadly we don't get to see a lot of, um, probably any in Michigan, <laughs> unless it's in a cage. Uh, but these birds may not migrate at all in a year because there might be a ton of resources that year. And so they just stay there year round. Uh, other years, that resource, maybe it was a really bad spruce budworm outbreak year and there's not a lot of spruce cones. So they moved to where possibly other spruce cones did well and the budworm wasn't out. Um, they may stay there that year or they may go back. Uh, and then they might find that next year that's not there and they go to another spot. So each year could be slightly different. The time of year is different. The location is different. So facultative always kind of head in the same direction, whereas eruptive are all over the place. And last but not least, you see the American robin, everyone's favorite sign of spring, right? Wrong. <laughs> Robins actually don't all migrate out of Michigan because they are partial migrants. And partial migration is a weird mix of genetics and food resources and also stuff we just don't know yet. And it's where essentially a portion of the population may move, but a portion might not. 
in Michigan, robins, a large portion of robins do leave, especially in the UP and in Northern Michigan. But in Southern Michigan, it's actually not that hard to find a robin if you head off into the shrubby areas along river plains and those kind of places where there's lots of fruit for them to eat. You don't see them as often because they're not hopping around on your yard eating bugs, but they are still around. They just tend to be in those thicker, brushier areas eating fruit and seeds. Um, so they are a partial migrant. So there you go. Now you know some migration strategies. <laughs> Do we have any questions at this point or any other things in the chat I missed? Oh, hooded mergansers too, Rebecca had lately, which is awesome. Um, those are a beautiful duck that we have in Michigan. All right, I've got some quizzes coming up here for you. So this is a chance for you to uh, take a guess on some different things. So pull up that chat and get it ready because we're gonna talk about spring migration. I'm gonna re-screen share one more time, make sure I'm sharing audio here. There we go. All right, we're gonna do a little sound quiz and move through the seasons of migration. So we have a, a kind of migration in Michigan sort of runs from March, maybe even late February, um, but definitely March through May or maybe the first week of June. So March through May is the general time frame, um, And I'm gonna show you a slide here and we're gonna listen to the sound of one of the earliest sounds I hear that reminds me of spring. And it's actually of a non-migratory bird, but it's a bird that starts to sing in kind of February and March as they get ready to start making their nests. Um, these are non-migratory birds, but they're birds that, only, that tend to make this call more in the early, early spring since they're already here and they're ready to get going. All right, so put in the chat if you know what bird makes this call. And it's a little loud, so I apologize for that. Here we go. This is a common backyard bird. I see we've got some, uh, uh, I, there's uh, some answers starting to come through. Oh, we've got some folks that know their birds. This is the chickadee. Yes, this is the black cap chickadee call. So this is a, a mainly non-migratory bird, or there's some evidence they may be partially migratory. Um, but this bird will tend to make that call more in the early, early parts of spring. And that is an advantage to them as a resident bird to set up their territory and start getting ready for their nest earlier than the other songbirds. All right, so that's sort of a, a non-migratory one, but great job with that uh, chickadee call. It's different than the call that you hear year round, which is chickadee dee dee. Uh, it's more of their territorial call. All right, here's the next one. And this will be for a bird that is one of our earlier migrants. Um, this will be from a, uh, a facultative or resource-based migrant. Um, so one that moves based on resources. So let's take a listen to this and see if you can give it a guess, A, B, C, or D. And some folks that know their birds here. I see quite a few C's coming through. And yes, that is the sandhill crane. Now this is a sound that makes lets me know that maybe some point here in the UP, the snow will disappear. <laughs> because this is a bird that tends to come in when there's still a bit of snow on the ground often. Um, they'll be one of the first migrant birds to head back up. And if you live in Southern Michigan, you may even be around a place where you have a couple that never even migrate, especially if it's a warm winter. Um, but definitely through most of the parts of Michigan, you'll start to hear this call in February and in March, and it's the Sandhill Crane. And by April, they're moving through in a huge number. Deborah said she heard some at Kensington a few weeks ago. Kensington Metro Park is a great place to see Sandhill Cranes. There's normally a pair there that's quite brave. They get really used to people, so you got to be a little careful. Uh, but they are a beautiful, majestic bird um, that migrates through in an early part of the season. So great job, folks. All right, let's do another one. I've got a couple more here. All right. I'm seeing some guesses come in. 
A, 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 yes. And that is A. Really quick, back to the Sandhill Cranes before we move on. I did see somebody said that they have their babies there already. And that is because they are such an early migrant. They already have their nests and their babies are hatched and they're out and about. Um, but this is another early migrant that we just heard. And that is correct for those of you that said A. That is the red winged blackbird. The males come in first before the females. The females are brown and streaky. They kind of look like a sparrow. But the males set up early territories, again, um, oftentimes when there's still snow on the ground. I don't know what they find to eat when they get up here. <laughs> but in any marshy area, you hear that sound, you know spring is not too far away. All right, now let's get one that is, uh, we're going to move on to one that is a later migrant. So this, is a, uh, this one will be a songbird that comes in at, probably not normally until May. So they're a neotropical bird that goes all the way very far south. They've got a long journey to get back here. And let's see if you can recognize this one. This is a tough one. Mm. It's a beautiful call. It kind of jumbled up and messy. We've got a few guesses in here. I started hearing these calls about two weeks ago here in the UP, maybe a week and a half ago. It's a little bit... Um, yeah, so it is, for those of you that guessed it, the beautiful C, rose-breasted grosbeak. The rose-breasted grosbeak, which is the bird with the bright pink um, spot or bib on its chest there, is uh, a bird that loves to eat seeds, but also insects. And it is an obligate migrant. And it's not going to come back here until uh, mid-May or so. Because if they were an obligate migrant that came back in April, some years they would definitely die. <laughs> they cannot handle the cold. So those obligate migrants tend to be on pretty strict schedules and pretty push them late into the spring so they don't accidentally get too cold. All right, so that's just kind of an overview. I've got some pictures here, but you can um, definitely ask questions at any point here. Um, but I'm just going to run through the seasons or the months of migration in Michigan just to give you a, a flavor of this. Okay, this is going to be fast and furious, cool pictures. Um, I did tell uh, folks, or I, I don't know if I told folks, but I will be sending um, the resources that I share here to the library as well as um, a PDF of the slides. So don't feel like you got to jot anything down here. Um, if you were, I don't know if you were, uh, but <laughs> uh, this will all be sent to you afterwards. So all right, so March is essentially kind of the start of the migration season. And the first things that migrate are birds that spent the winter here, actually, believe it or not. Uh, we have migratory birds that are only here in the winter. Where their wintering location, where the nice balmy Michigan that they escape to in the winter <laughs> before they head back to the high Arctic in the summer, um, believe it or not. So things like snowy owls, uh, red poles, pine grosbeaks, beaks, and juncos, the bird there at the bottom right, the gray bird, those are all going to leave in March. They're going to migrate north. They're going to have been here just for the winter. Um, and then in comes the new raptors. So eagles and hawks and falcons are some of our earliest migrants. Um, they are able to head back up into Michigan, oftentimes in March. And so they will be an early migrant. Um, golden eagles even start migrating in February. We don't have a lot of golden eagles, but we do have sun. And if you want to see some, the Mackinac Straits Raptor Watch in the Straits of Mackinac, it's an awesome place to see early um, uh, raptor migration in March. Bald eagles and American kestrels, rough-legged hawks and northern harriers, um, migrating hawks are just truly incredible. So we get a lot to come in in March. And then we also have the waterfowl. Of course, this depends on the year. If we have a really cold year, that waterfowl migration might be delayed a little bit. But you're especially downstate, you're going to see waterfowl moving through in March. Um, so geese, uh, ducks, we have many duck species. Swans, like tundra swans that migrate in the um, hundreds sometimes, flocks of hundreds of tundra swans, beautiful birds. If you're down in it's like the Ann Arbor area on the Huron River, uh, you might see some trumpeter swans that are down there for the winter and start heading north. So lots of beautiful waterfall in March. We also have the sandhill cranes start to return near the end of March and blackbirds. We have more than just red winged blackbirds down there in the bottom right. We have a brown headed cowbird, um, which is the one with the brown head. <laughs> well, actually, there's two with brown heads, isn't there? The bottom. Uh, 
left bird is the brown-headed cowbird, the rusty blackbird, the one with the yellow eye that has the kind of the rusty brown color, and common grackles. These will move through in big flocks, often in the hundreds, in mixed species even. Um, and they're coming through as soon as the snow is off on those agricultural fields, you'll see them picking grains or bugs right off of there, or in your backyard, uh, descending on your yard in a massive flock and cleaning out your feeders. <laughs> Oh yeah, Deborah says she's seen lots of trumpeters on the river in the winter. Yeah, they tend to winter down there in the Ann Arbor area and then head off north to some of the inland ponds and lakes in Michigan to breed. All right, um, so that's kind of a sample of March. We got waterfowl, raptors, blackbirds, and cranes um, are kind of the early things that start to show up in March and they'll continue to migrate through April. Um, but in April, or what I like to call pre-May, <laughs> because May is the best month, by the way. Um, May is just, a, we'll get there. But the, we do get some early songbirds that start to show up in April. So swallows are one of the first um, my, long range migratory songbirds that show up along with some thrushes, a few warblers and lots of sparrows. April is a great month to work on your sparrows um, because we get many varieties, including the beautiful fox sparrow, which I think is just the most gorgeous color, brownish, reddish, orangish out there. Um, but other great sparrows too, uh, like the white crown sparrow or white throated, or it says Vesper sparrow, but I think it's a Savannah sparrow. I'm gonna have to go back and check that one. Uh, <laughs> and also in April, we get turns and gulls. To every season, there is a turn, turn, turn. Uh, and so, sorry, <laughs> I couldn't help it. Uh, we have a couple of different species of these beautiful birds called terns that a lot of people think they're a type of seagull, um, but they're a little bit different with a more narrow bill, very angular, beautiful wings. And we have a migratory species of seagull, if you didn't know, a gull called a Bonaparte's gull that has uh, black heads and you can see them flying along the Great Lakes in April and into May. Um, so that's another April migrant. And at the very end of April, if you're lucky, this is really more into May, um, you might start to see the hummingbirds show, show up. This is a map of hummingbirds where they were in, uh, I think, March and early April. By the end of April, the first one or two might start to show up, but really we're waiting for May when we open up the floodgates. May is the month of migration madness, and we are in the heart of it right now. So if you have any inclination to go see birds, now is a great month to get out there and see birds. There are huge flocks of all sorts of types of birds. So we have one type of hawk called a broadwing hawk, and they move through actually quote more so in May, late April and May. And they will be in flocks or kettles of hundreds. I was at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory last week, and I got to see about 200 bird hawks in the air at the exact same time, just all swirling in a giant mass. They ride these warm air thermals up, and it's just a sight to behold. Amazing. We also get things like orioles, grosbeaks, and tanagers start to come in, and the indigo bunting. The pops of color in your feeders, if you have bird feeders in, the, in May, can be fantastic. Just yesterday, I had two indigo buntings, a Baltimore Oriole, a rose-breasted grosbeak, American goldfinches. It was just a, a, a cacophony, is that a word? I don't know, of color. It was, it was beautiful. It was so nice to see that bright orange, that deep blue, um, those bright reds all popping up there. So May is really good um, for that. And Penny says that, um, yes, the Kensington Metro Park is a great place to see that. Um, there's also, there's great places all across the state. Anywhere where there's Great Lakes shoreline can be great. Um, any sort of, uh, if you're in an urban area and you have a green space, those urban green spaces can really concentrate migratory birds. Um, but this is just the tip of the iceberg for May, folks. We also have Neotropical migrant warblers, the colorful little tiny birds. These don't tend to go to feeders very often. They like to eat bugs pretty exclusively, but if you'll find them on branches on rainy days, they'll be lower uh, down in the trees, but they'll be all across the trees. And these birds fly over in the millions in our over our heads every night in the Great Lakes. Um, there are a variety of species, um, well over 20 that you could see at any given point. I got to see 17 species of these bright little um, colorful gems at Whitefish Point the other day. Um, and they, a lot of them do not stay here. So they're only here in this short chunk of May where they uh, fly through. Some will breed in Michigan, many are headed up north. So neotropical migrant warblers, also vireos, which are pretty similar, flycatchers, wrens, 
thrushes, shorebirds, and more waterfall, and more raptors, and more of everything. May is amazing. So if anything else from this talk, I hope it inspires you to go outside tomorrow morning, because there's probably going to be a few million songbirds that fly over your head tonight, and they will be landing in the morning, and you'll get a chance to see them. All right, so that was just a kind of snapshot. Um, definitely not the complete picture, but just a little taste of what spring migration is like in Michigan. I'm going to end with this last part here and telling you how you can get out there and see it and some of the resources in Michigan to find good birding locations and to see migration. Um, but before that, I'll just check the chat. And if you have any questions, do throw them in there. Um, oh, yeah. And you had, a, you had a hummingbird at the library today. Excellent. That's awesome. Was that your first sighting for the year? Okay, that was the first sighting for the year. So yeah, Mother's Day is often the date that a lot of people put their hummingbird feeders back out. That's around the time they start to come and that wasn't too long ago. So I saw my first ones about a week ago, I think. All right, so where or how do you get to know about where all these birds are? Um, well, there's a lot of different resources out there, but you may have heard me reference the fact that there are millions of birds flying over every night, which might be a bit of a shock, but tonight it is predicted through the BirdCast uh, website that 328 million birds are going to fly over the continental United States. That's a lot of birds. So songbirds migrate at night because it's safer. They don't have to worry about hawks picking them off in the air. And so they are tend to be night migrants. They also use, like we talked about, the stars. And incredibly, Doppler radar can actually pick up the birds migrating. If you ever in the spring or fall pull up a, a raw Doppler radar feed, you will notice at after sunset, a ring around the radar pops up of light blue or even dark green. And that's literally Doppler radar picking up the millions of birds flying in the air every night. These birds, there's so many that it shows up on Doppler radar. The wet, um, the company or the, the organization Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Colorado State University have perfected the ability of looking at those Doppler radars and reading how many birds. They've actually run models to predict how many birds are showing up on that radar based on the density. And to now we have this tool called BirdCast that uses Doppler radar and shows us how many birds are migrating every night. And they do predictions, and then you can see the live feeds of how many are actually birding. Uh, this was the, um, my, they have a, a dashboard on there, and this was for Michigan um, for last night. Last night, uh, about, about 1.3 million birds flew over Michigan. Um, the peak, though, uh, a few nights earlier or uh, farther back was around 3.3 million. So we could have millions of birds flying over any night. All sorts of cool charts and graphs, if you like um, that kind of thing on birdcast.info. You can see the migration dashboard. And I always check these in the morning sometimes. And if it was really good, that might be the day that I call in sick to work. I didn't say that. Uh, but <laughs> I can actually time when I go birding based on that when it was a really good night migration. Because if it was a really good night migration, the birds land at dawn and you're going to get to see a lot more. So it's a great resource and just also an impressive thing to look at and to contemplate how many birds are flying over your head every night. Another great resource is uh, Michigan's Birding Trails, which uh, these links are really hard to read, so I apologize. But the Michigan Audubon website has all but the most new one listed. And these birding trails are around the state, and they're essentially websites or printed maps that tell you where to go birding and what you can see. Um, so going to the Michigan Audubon website or the um, St. Clair Macomb Birding Trail website will give you a really good layout for these particular parts of the state. So I highly recommend checking out the birding trails if you wanna just learn about where some good spots are to go birding. Uh, next, there's also a website called eBird. eBird is a place where citizens can report their bird list that they see. And um, they, it, anyone, any birder can get on there, create an account and report their birds. But once you report the birds, it goes into an international database um, that has over a, uh, 
over 500 million submissions now. It's a worldwide phenomenon and birders across the world are submitting what they're seeing to this. This helps you as a birder learn where stuff is because you can search all these things. You can search locations, hotspots, particular species. Um, and it also helps scientists. It's actually revolutionized the science of ornithology because with that many sightings, we now have a way better picture of where all the birds are in the world. It's helped turn birders into scientists. And if you are a birder, I highly recommend you use this website. But if you're not, or even if you are, regardless, use it also to find what's out there. It'll show you bar charts like this that show you what months bird migrations peak in and how long, and it's just a whole source of great resources, plus profiles you can make. Um, so you can kind of share who you are with other birders if you want, that's an optional part. All right, uh, another great way to get out is spring birding festivals. Most of these are past, but um, Warblers on the Water is on Beaver Island, that's coming up really soon. And the Eldo Leopold Festival in the UP is really soon as well. And these are other great um, ways to see migration. The Mackinac Raptor Fest, like I talked about, is at the very end of March, early April, when golden eagles are peaking and many other um, migratory raptors are peaking. So there's lots of good chances to get out there and bird with other people and to see these amazing migration spectacles. All right, so that's just a taste of where you can bird. Um, oh, and it sounds like the library has a bird watching kit too which is awesome. Libraries are such incredible resources. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And it's so, it so warms my heart to know that you have binoculars because binoculars are the biggest um, kind of one of the biggest hurdles for people getting into bird birding. Thankfully, there are, there are cheaper options now, even down in like the $50 range that are that can get you started. Um, but still, that, that's a barrier. So if you want to try it out, head over to the Lion, uh, Lion Township Library and check out that kit to bring with you birding. All right, one last, this will be my last thing. Uh, and it's just a quick note on how you care for the birds in migration. Um, so like we said, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of natural obstacles to birds and bird migration and humans have made those obstacles worse and also added a lot more obstacles. So a few things you can do. Um, one is to always, uh, if you do get into birding, study the birding code of ethics from the American Birding Association and follow that. We don't want birders to become part of the problem. And in general, birders are not. They're part of the solution by being aware of migratory birds and implementing things to help migratory birds. But we do wanna make sure if you decide to get into this hobby to learn what some of the ethics are. Um, so that's a great thing to do. Um, but the more kind of practical solution for how you can help migratory birds come from your own backyard. Our own backyards are filled with threats to migratory birds um, often. And, and it's often not on purpose. It's things that we're not even aware of. So I want you really quick in the chat, see what uh, human-based threats to birds might be in this yard. What human-based threats to birds might be in this yard? So if you wanna put in the chat, what are some things here you see that could be a threat? And I, I was a little sneaky with this. This might be a tough one, um, but I do see some answers coming in. Oh yes, okay, so right off the bat, folks noted windows. There's a lot of windows here and window collisions can be a big one. Uh, we also see, somebody noticed that there's a, a cat or, I can't remember if I put a cat in here or a cat scratcher. Uh, there's a cat scratcher on the porch, but outdoor cats are a big problem. Um, pesticides we see too, that's a good one. That, that one's a subtle one. There's a couple more, any other guesses before I show you the answers here? All right, so here are the, some of the threats I noticed. Um, so cats, like we said, cats, outdoor cats kill um, billions of birds in the United States each year. Pesticides, um, particularly pesticides that kill insects, but some that kill weeds as well, uh, are a huge problem. Most of our insect feeding birds, which is most of the songbirds in North America, have seen major declines in the last few decades. And that a big part of that can be attributed to the mass die off of insects. Although it's really tempted to to gas your entire backyard and kill all those pesky insects. Um, the reality is those insects uh, are really important part of our ecosystem. They're the food for so many things. And when you actually have healthy populations of insects, you don't get massive pest problems. Um, you get predatory insects like dragonflies. My backyard each <laughs> summer is filled with mosquitoes, but right around those mosquitoes come out, the dragonflies come out and they take that population of mosquitoes way down. 
Uh, <laughs> purple loosestrife was planted in this yard, um, or I put the image there, and that's an invasive species. So what you plant really matters. And then reflective windows, and finally outdoor lights. Outdoor lights are thrown, known to um, confuse birds during their night migration. So if you have an outdoor light and it's on all night, save yourself some money and get a timer and also help the birds. Just again, to, to reference it, one thing I didn't put on there is clean your feeders. If you do feed the birds, clean your feeders. This will help prevent the spread of disease. Right now, avian flu is going around. That's a big concern for commercial um, and backyard chicken flocks. It's a big concern for waterfowl and raptors. It's not shown to be a huge issue in songbirds, but it's still really important to keep your bird, keep, keep your bird feeders clean. Um, consider the cats. Like I said, outdoor cats, as much as we love our pet cats, and I love cats, I think they're great, they should be inside. Indoor cats are safer, um, they generally live a much longer, healthier life, and they don't kill birds. Um, there are lots of studies that show that outdoor cats and those that particularly become feral, but also um, domestic ones, kill a huge chunk of birds. They're essentially considered an invasive species by most ecologists, and they have become a real big problem in many countries around the world. So keep your cats indoors, especially, I know it's hard if you already have one outdoors, um, but if you decide to get a new cat, commit to keeping it indoors. Build a little cat patio or get a cat leash, um, but don't just let it roam free. It's bad for the cat, and it's bad for the birds. Um, no wall up on the windows. So windows are a huge killer of birds. They don't know that it's a window and they just fly right into it. And there's lots of things you can use. I use little clings, decorative clings in my house. And we put those up and that, that takes care of the problem for the most part for us. There's all sorts of fancy things you can buy, but just buy the window clings, put something up there so they know they can't fly through that. Pass on the pesticides. More and more research shows that they're causing cancer or that they're causing other health problems. Um, and so you know, rat poison in particular is huge, huge killer for um, raptors, because if you poison those mice, that poison stays in their body and then a predator eats that dead mouse and they become poisoned. Um, also pesticides that kill insects are a real big uh, problem for birds. And uh, a no-go on the night glow. <laughs> so again, uh, save yourself some money. Just don't have that light on all night. I know that the dark is scary, uh, but <laughs> we'll just turn the lights on when we go outside instead of keeping them on nonstop. So with that, those are some simple things you can do. And I'm gonna pass over that. I've got my email here and my phone number and the Michigan Sea Grant website. You can go to our website and I have a four part birding series. If you would like to learn more about how to be a birder and the kind of the technical aspect you can check out. Also, uh, like we said, we'll email you these resources we referenced and I'm happy to take any questions. I know I, I flew through a lot and I talk really fast too. So if there's anything you want me to go back over or any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question. I have a question. I have go a ahead. question. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have had a feeder consistently for, I don't know, 10 years. And mm -hmm. I had the same little nut hatches and chickadees and goldfinches. And it's just been wonderful. In the spring, Bring right about April, I get these starlings, I think they are. Hmm. And they just descend on the, on the, and they, they kind of bully all the little, you know, guys that are always there. They kind of bully them away. Well, mm -hmm. it usually lasts about a week and then they're gone, but mm -hmm. they're staying this year. So my nut hatches are gone. The chickadees, hmm. You know they kind of come and go but it's a lot of a lot of time the woodpeckers seem to stand up to them but they're sort they've sort of taken over so i was just wondering if you had any insight in that into that or if it's just something i'd be dealing with yeah yeah so starlings are um an interesting species so you will often like you said uh, get blackbirds that descend on your feeders in the spring and kind of take over for a little bit, but, but normally they move on. Starlings are unique in that they are actually not a native species to North America. Rather, they're a non-native species. Their full name is European starling. So you can guess where they came from. Um, <laughs> they were brought over by folks from Europe who were like, let's bring Europe to North America and let everything go. Um, 
we learned that was a bad idea after stuff started taking over. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, what probably, I, I can't say exactly why the starlings didn't leave this year, but starlings have some migratory habit. So probably most years they were migrating through just like your other blackbirds, but something must have caused them to think, this area is worth staying. They're sort of um, a facultative migrant where they'll move where there's food. Um, they'll move when there's not food. And so to prevent, you know, they're a nuisance species. Um, they are actually one of the few species that are not protected under the Migratory Bird Act. So you can, uh, you know, humanely remove them or euthanize them if you so choose, but you have to be really sure they're European starlings because native blackbird species like brackles and stuff, you cannot do that legally. Um, an easier solution, though, might be to just take your feeders down for a couple of weeks because those that species in particular is in a migratory mode right now and, and it is a migrant that migrates based on food availability. If you take your feeder down, it, they may move on. But the other factor that could be going on is they may be sticking around not just because of you and your one feeder, but rather something in your region that is a food source um, that is they've noticed and caused them to stay. Um, so if taking your feeders down after a couple of week, a week or two and you put them back up, they're right back. The next kind of option would be to diversify your feeding space. So providing some ground feeders or some other types of hanging feeders, switching up your feed. Like if you feed um, black oil sunflower seed, maybe add some wild bird seed or some safflower seed by providing or, or corn. Um, the starlings actually really like corn. So if you put corn on a platform feeder, they may flock to the corn and then they may leave your small hanging feeder uh, more available for your chickadees and things like that. So by diversifying your backyard mm -hmm. feeding space, you can potentially at least provide an alternative place for them to go and open up a new place for your um, preferred birds there. Okay, great. Well, thank you. No problem. Yeah, Penny says she has the same same problem. Just stop feeling filling the feeders for a couple of weeks. So, now uh, personally, if the if they're a mixed blackbird flock like um, grackles and red winged blackbirds, I love when they descend on my yard. I think it's really cool, and I'll. I'll keep a really close eye because sometimes mixed into those flocks will be a rusty blackbird, which is a bird that may be coming listed on the endangered species list because they've seen huge drop offs in their numbers. Um, but you could end up with a rusty blackbird. Some folks end up getting luckily a yellow headed blackbird that will show up rarely. So you never know what could be mixed into those blackbird flocks, but the starlings in particular are definitely a nuisance. Yeah. Any other questions about feeding birds or um, bird migration? birding as a hobby. I will say if you do have other questions later, you're always welcome to email me or uh, shoot me a text. Um, there's also some great Facebook groups out there like Birding Michigan. Um, is a great one. That's a community of folks. Not everyone knows what they're talking about on there, but <laughs> uh, but you could pose questions there and get a lot of great input. Um, there's also a group from the American Birding Association on Facebook called What's This Bird? The entire point of that group is to post your picture of bird and have people tell you what it is. <laughs> so those are some good resources too. Well, Elliot, I think this is really a fascinating program. I, I really enjoyed it and I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, we appreciate that you're going to share your resources with us and your slides. And, you know, we've, we've really, uh, there's, like you said, there's a lot to go through. So if we can go through it at our own pace <laughs> again, that'll yeah. be really great. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone who attended and, uh, we hope to, uh, everyone has a great summer of birding and, and, uh, learning about, uh, all of the wonderful birds that are flying over us in the middle of the night that I didn't even know about that. So I learned a lot tonight. Great. And we are getting some several thank yous in the chat. So I, I don't think I was alone in enjoying your program very much. Well, good. Glad to hear that. Bird on everyone. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for attending. Bye-bye.